Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by the members of OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with ManicExpression.com, the website where you can truly express yourself. Welcome aboard to this week's episode of Casual Chats. Finally, we have reached episode number 20, and it's going to be a very special one. As usual, I am Patricia. And I'm Kevin. And today, we have ourselves a very special guest. The special guest has an upcoming book, simply known as Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, which chronologically talks about... Nickelodeon when it first started as a local network on Columbus, Ohio, to becoming known as the number one kids network. The author of the book is um, Matthew Clickstein. Uh, is it Clickstein or Clickstein? You know, even my grandfather didn't know that. We were given that name at Ellis Island, and uh, I've been both Stein and Steen through much of my life, but uh, these days I normally go by Steen, but Stein is okay. Although a lot of people tend to call me Mike or Michael for some reason, which is really weird because both my dad and my stepdad's name is Mike. So as long as you got Matthew Clicks, it Clickstein is fine. Let's, let's do Clickstein. Okay, okay, I'll just edit that part out. Um, the book slime. Oh, really? You should leave that in. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll just edit that part out. Okay, so casual. Okay, okay. The, yeah, you're right. This is casual. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, so yes. Um, if you just tuned in right now, we have the author of the book, Matthew Clickstein. So, Matthew, welcome aboard to Casual Chats. Thank you. How casual. It very is. Casual. In, yes, it is indeed very casual. Now, now, interestingly, we actually interviewed you almost a year ago, and uh, we asked you basic questions about what the book is going to be about. So let's just cut into more of a deeper understanding of what the book is really going to be about, without you giving away t- too much, of course. Yeah. And I have to say, Patty, I think you guys were the first people ever to interview me about this book. I think you guys have that honor of being numero uno. Oh, wow. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is is quite an achievement. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you guys interviewed me, I don't even think, it wasn't even written yet, right? You guys got a hold of me, like, when I first announced that we were even doing it, I think. So, or right around then. Yeah, yeah, so. pretty early because we wanted to be the first to try to get into get an interview with you before everybody else does. Yeah, you won. You won. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, yeah um, the book has taken on many different incarnations over said year. Um, one of them is concision. Um, I turned in two hundred and seventy thousand words, and the book is ninety thousand words. So you do the math. Uh, a lot definitely got cut out, um, but I think it's a good thing because, um, as I tell everyone, it's the same joke, only now we're cutting right to the punchline. Uh, I think that there's enough information out there already um, that really gets into the nitty-gritty of how these shows uh, originated, uh, where a lot of the names for characters came from, and some of these other things, especially over the year, there's been reunions and there's been a lot more things like what you guys are doing and a lot and BuzzFeed and what have you. And, you know, so I'm really cutting right to the stuff that you really haven't heard yet. And some more of the intimate details um, about the people themselves, what they went through, their experiences. Um, And, you know, I would imagine in different forms we'll release some more of the earlier information that how things originated, the provenance of it all. Um, and that kind of thing. But for now, the book is really 
cuts right to the chase, and it's really what was it like to be at Nick? Um, what was it like to be on these shows? What went wrong? What went right? Um, and I think I got to be honest. As much as it pained me to cut out two thirds of the book. Uh, I think it was the right decision because now it's it's so fun to read and you just can read right through it and get it all and um, you know and, and there'll be future printings where we'll probably put in some more of the older stuff and that kind of thing. Yeah, I can understand that because um, when I talked to Cassine Gaines roughly around a year ago discussing about when he was publishing Inside Pee-wee's Playhouse, he pretty much said the same thing. There were a lot of things that had to be cut, like people that he interviewed and some stories that didn't really flow cohesively to what he was writing in the first place. So I can understand that. And since Kevin and I are both writers and bloggers, we definitely know when it comes to writing a movie or a script or whatever that there are some things that eventually do need to be cut out. Yeah, I've always been really good at killing my darlings. Um, I write very quickly. I write a lot. Um, and I'm usually working on a few different things at once. So, um, you know, I have my dream projects. I have some of the projects that are a little closer to my heart. This one definitely was and is. Um, you know, I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. The fact that I actually got to do it is incredible to me still, um, especially considering I'm nobody. I mean, I'm you know, I'm not anybody special. I, you know, and I, I, you know, that's a whole other thing. I think that the book needed to be written by someone who's not an editor of a magazine or whatever. But point of story being um, that uh, you know it was difficult, but it definitely needed to be done. And, uh, you know, part of it, too, is uh, David Foster Wallace uh, talked a lot about this when he was working on Infinite Jest and the, the promotions afterwards. It, some of it's an economic, a lot of it's an economic thing. I mean, I was told from day one from Penguin, we don't want a brick. I mean, that's very expensive to print out. That's very expensive to ship. Um, that's very expensive in the stores. They have to raise the price points. Um, and for good or ill, we have to uh, be subservient to the marketplace and these logistical issues. Um, so, you know, but I, I think, again, like I said, I think it, it created a better book that's going to be a lot more interesting than the one that I turned in, which had a lot more, uh, it was a lot more turgid and it was a lot more basic information that I think people are already aware of and people who aren't aware of it, I think that they would have been a little bored. I was even, when I was going through different drafts of it, always kind of a lot more excited when I got to page like 150. And I was like, all right, this is where it really starts. So that we had to cut a lot out for economic reasons, sort of, I think also uh, was a better thing for aesthetic reasons. And that's when we really get that nice sweet spot of, you know, the aesthetics and the economics come together. Because they are linked. And, you know, you could say whatever you want, but... It's important. You know, I didn't just write this for myself or for friends. I wanted to sell this thing, and I want people to be able to read it and get it and pass it around to each other and, and bring it on the, the train or whatever. Um, and that's a lot harder to do when it's this, like, 700-page monster. So. Yeah, I completely um, understand. And it's actually quite, a, um, quite an accomplishment for you to write a book about Nickelodeon because even though that there have been two Nickelodeon books, but they're not really about the show per se. They're more about, you know, how it became a huge marketing and, you know, big commercially successful network. Yeah, I'm actually very close with, well, not close, I'm friendly with Heather Hendershot, who did the first book. Uh, and to be sure, not to, um, you know, uh, degrade what they did or anything like that. Both books were very helpful, especially Heather's in my uh, initial research. Um, but they are both uh, academic texts. Um, in fact, Heather's, uh, which is Nickelodeon Nation, and I think everyone should get it and read it. It's a great book. It's fantastic. Is literally a collection of essays, of scholarly essays, written, many of them by professors. Heather herself is a professor. Um, and it's basically, yeah, it's a collection of, of such essays. Um, about Nick as a cultural force and, and, yeah, how it came to be. A lot of it's just, you know, interviews and that kind of thing. And the second book uh, by Sarah Benet Walker, I believe her name is, or Wesser, um, is actually an extrapolation of one of the essays in Heather's book. Um, they're both great. I particularly like Nickelodeon Nation, but they're academic texts, and they were, for, they were meant for an academic, um, you know, arena for classes on TV and, uh, media and that kind of thing. And, and again, I, I don't mean to um, 
say that they're not great books. They are. But we, the Nick Collodian book that I'm doing and that I worked on um, is really for a mainstream audience. I, I think people will be able to read this who didn't watch these shows, who didn't grow up on these shows, who might not know that much about them. Uh, just because a lot of what these people had to say to me um, is very universal. Um, a lot of it's very funny. A lot of it's very sad. And I think that there's a really good um, narrative arc, uh, a good you know ABC uh, storyline going on, and subtext, context. It, it it's almost reads like a novel. I have to say. I mean, uh, and I think that's why we also you know you, you, we might be seeing a, a film adaptation. Uh, sooner than later, I don't know, um, because yeah. there's a real story there, um, and, uh, you know, this is not an academic text, this is not just for people who know about Nickelodeon, this is someone, you can read it and just say, wow, that was a good story, with some great characters. Yeah, definitely, I, I definitely agree. I, I actually have a question to ask, Matt, if you don't mind, just yeah. when you were talking about, a, when you were saying about a film adaptation, as you know, uh, they were trying to get before Disney had owned Doug, they were trying to, to make a Doug movie and a Ren and Stimpy movie. And I've always wanted to ask this to, like, a fellow Nickelodeon fan because uh, I get, like, different answers. What would you think... I mean, it's off topic, but what would, how would you feel if they were to make... And I'm not talking about Disney stuff. I'm talking about, like, the Nickelode if, like Nickelodeon at the time. How would you feel... Or how do you think it would be if they, if they actually did go forward to make a Ren and Stimpy movie and a Doug movie? Uh, well, I, those are two very different questions, um, but good ones. I never really thought about it before. Uh, yeah, um, John and uh, John Crystalusi and Bob Camp, um, in particular, brought up the the Ren and Stimpy movies. That was definitely a very real uh, thing at one point. Um, they were ready to go, and you know, but that unfortunately happened when the calamity occurred. That I'm sure most of your listeners know about and is discussed very much in the book, and there's even a whole other book just about right. Ren and Stimpy that Thad did. Um, but uh, you know, um, you know, let, we can't forget uh, uh, Son of Stimpy. Ah, uh, uh, yes. You know, with Stinky the fart. Yes, I do and, remember. I mean, that was that was uh, technically an hour. I mean, that was a two-parter. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, I think that it went really well. You know, um, I think if they had added in one or two other little elements, that could have been a full film. Um, and you know, we've seen South Park be able to pull that off too with uh, Imagination Land. I mean, that's base that's basically a film. That was what three? Yeah. I think that was three or four episodes. Yes. And they did that a couple times. You know, with uh, Satan and uh, Saddam Hussein and. You know, they've, they've done a few of those even on South Park, and it works. I think it can be done with an animated show like Ren and Stimpy yeah. um, or Doug because they're basically short films. And I think that that's something that we're not seeing as much anymore, um, you know, with, with television in general, uh, specifically animation, where now it is more just, you know, gag, 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 and then the show's over. Um Doug and Ren and Stimpy were really special because they they were like little short films. And if we just um, expanded on what was going on in each episode, I could have seen uh, a film happen. I think it would have been um, a lot more interesting with Ren and Stimpy. There was a lot more creativity that they could play with there. Uh, Doug, I think, would have been a better film just yeah. because uh, Doug was always kind of like, to me, it was always sort of like Wonder Years. It was a lot cleaner, obviously. Um, and it was a lot, you know, much more character development and much more story development and a real, again, beginning, middle, and end, whereas Ren and Stimpy was almost purposely very chaotic. Um, the writers from that show, the directors from that show did some amazing work, um, but, you know, they were purposely subverting the entire uh, realm of narrative, and um, I think it would be a little bit harder to really engage in a full Ren and Stimpy film, although like I said, they did it pretty well with Son of Stimpy. Um, I think Doug, again, I think Doug would be a better film. I think Ren and Stimpy would be more creative and funnier, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. And also another movie that almost was to be one, but it never did, was there was going to be an Adventures of Pete and Pete movie, and then Will McRobb and Chris Viscardi decided to do Snow Day instead. That's actually a really interesting story. Um, I'm actually not too familiar with... Um, what's been reported on the background of that, but what Will, Chris, um, Albie Hecht, and some of the other executives and people at Nick told me 
um, was that Snow Day was actually supposed to be basically the Pete and Pete movie. And if you watch it close enough, you can really see that the character dynamics between the brother and the sister, there's a real Pete and Pete element there. Um, and that it was originally going to be the Pete and Pete movie, um, but was uh, obviously uh, greatly changed for a number of reasons. Actors had, you know, age. Um, it took a lot longer in, in what we know as development hell for the movie to actually get made. Uh, there were decisions being made by the studio. The studio itself changed a lot to make it, to sublimate it a little bit. Even Will and Chris both admitted to me that they're proud of the film, they like the film, but if it could have been a little bit more of their original vision, it would have been to them a little better, and we would have definitely seen it be more of a Pete and Pete movie, as they both told me. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what that's my understanding of it. I could have misunderstood what they told me. Um, but one thing you guys might not know, and I don't know if I should be mentioning this, although there's more about it in the book, is there was also almost an Are You Afraid of the Dark film. Are you guys aware of that? Yes, I, d I am aware of it. And I think the closest one that would have been a movie was one of the last episodes in Season 7 called The Tale of the Silver Sight. Well, and, um, you know, Cutter's Treasure was, was a two part it. Yeah, yeah, Cutter's yeah. Treasure. That was, an, uh, that was another... It as a, as a, as a DVD or VHS. Was it, I don't even think DVD was out yet. No. Um, and I actually I had a chance to talk to Charles S. Dutton. He was amazing. Oh, um, wow. And he was so happy to talk about it. He really got a lot out of that. It was really one of his favorite projects he ever did. Um, and he was so uh, elated to be able to do something a little different and be kind of a villain. Um, and really had a lot of fun with it. And he just he felt the production value and that kind of thing really stood up to some of the films that he was in. I mean, you know, he was in these big films like Rudy and David Fincher's Alien 3. Uh, you know, so he really, I think, understood the uh, importance of production value. And some of what he talked about, I don't think he was just blowing smoke because he could have said, oh, that was fun, that was really nice. But he got pretty specific about how impressed he was by certain elements. And, you know, as he said, it wasn't just this kind of children's, entertainment let's just get it done with he felt that the crew really put a lot of a special time and energy into it but uh no the, the are you afraid of the dark film was um something that never saw the light of day but was a screenplay um and it was actually going to involve the boogeyman and sardo uh and it sounded really scary actually from what dj McHale, the creator told me um, unfortunately one of the reasons they couldn't make it and and i hate to say it, this seems true even still today was there was no possibility of doing that kind of a genre where it was not quite really scary, but it was not it was not necessarily for kids. Like it was, he wanted it to be really really spooky. He wanted it to really scare kids. And unfortunately, then and I'd say probably a little bit now, if you're going to make a movie for kids, you can't really scare them. So he kind of ran into this difficult place of he didn't want it to be Scooby-Doo, he didn't want it to be too silly, he wanted it to be pretty scary, he wanted it to be scary for kids, and Nickelodeon and Paramount said, no, we're, we're not going to scare kids, we're not going to do it, and so he never got to make it, and what's sad is he told me he had just reread the script recently, and he said it's really good, and I believe him, because he's an amazing writer, he's actually doing a lot of uh, young adult novels now, like uh, um, Morpheus and uh, a few others, I forget the names of them, he just released a new one that he's on tour with right now, actually, so... Yeah, um, uh, Kevin and I, we interviewed DJ a couple of months ago, and he did tell us about that. But yeah. we never knew about this uh, upcoming movie. That would have been really interesting, especially at a time when Goosebumps was a huge popular craze. Yeah, it was, you know, it was really difficult for him. And, you know, it's sad. A few, not, not to, um, not to uh, uh, speak poorly of Nickelodeon now or then, um, I, I did hear this story a few times from some of the creators of these shows, um, where a few of them had ideas for films, a few of them had ideas for what else could happen. Um, I'm sure you and, and your listeners know that uh, Jim loves Nickelodeon. He loved his experience there. Uh, Jim Jenkins I'm talking about now. But he definitely was disappointed when things ended the way that they did. And, you know, there wasn't anything negative that happened like with Ren and Stimpy. Uh, it was just, you know, they were moving on, and he really felt strongly that he had more to tell in the story of Doug, and although things changed drastically with the Disney version, including Billy West uh, departing, which is really a shame, um, yeah. you know, j yeah, j j every, every show creator had more that they could have told, and more that they wanted to do, 
um, and movie ideas, and it was sad to hear that they weren't really able to do that, and uh, especially with the live action shows, because let's be honest, we'll never see those, because the actors are all, you know, 35 now, you know? Unless they reboot it. Well, yeah, I, ho- I really hope they don't, though, because that would be re- I mean, I think that was what was special about these shows, where the actors were so singular. Uh, no one looks like Danny Tamborelli or Michael Morona or Allison Finelli, and they still so much look exactly like they did then, even though it's 10 or 20 years later. Um, you know, what was special about Nickelodeon, especially some of the earlier shows, even like You Can't Do That on Television, Yes. and we talk a lot about this in the book, I'm sure, as you guys know, I mean, it was it was, and that's why I feel like it needed to be written by an average person, a regular "quote unquote" kid. That's what the network was for. It was these people that were almost pulled off the street. They were just these regular kids. Many of them had never acted before. Many of them would never act again. Um, and they just they looked like your friends from school. They had pimples. They had braces. They were fat. They were cross-eyed. Um, and they all looked very very interesting. If we look in our, if you look in your memory. You can really see Justin Cammy from You Can't Do That on Television or Marjorie or, or Vanessa, definitely. She was cross-eyed, for Christ's sakes. I mean, she was. She was on television. She'd host the show sometime. I mean, that's incredible. And I just, I don't think if they rebooted it and the way that they would, let's be frank, have to reboot it, where, you know, these blonde kids and that they would look really great and skinny and whatever, it wouldn't have the same magic as these kids that, you know, are down the street from where you grew up or, or kids that you know now or or whatever, you know, they're not going to have zits. And that was a really, really important aesthetic for Nickelodeon that we saw on every single show. That was so important, you know. And they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to do that financially if they rebooted it now. They just wouldn't. Yeah, um, there were a couple of exceptions when I did talk about a couple of shows that I might be possible to see remade. But yeah, there are a couple of shows that should never even be touched because you can never get that same spark that you got the first time. Especially nowadays when everything is completely different and everything continues to change over time. Yeah, I actually, um, the way, the metaphor I use for Nickelodeon then and now when people bring it up and they say, well, what's Nickelodeon doing now or, or, you know, what's happened to Nickelodeon or so forth is I say, look, it's like going to your favorite Italian restaurant that you used to go to as a kid 20 years later, and now they sell Chinese food, you know, or, or vice versa. Um, you know, it's it's the same building, uh, it's the same channel, but, you know, it's com- it's completely different uh, personnel, it's completely different shows, it's completely different sensibilities, and, you know, and, and I, I'm, I really did my best, and I think I succeeded at being as objective as possible in the book. I mean, the whole last chapter is kind of, you know, how did Nickelodeon change from then to now? Um, you know, and I, I got people like Adam Weissman, who started his career um, directing Welcome Freshman, and then moved on. He's doing, you know, these big shows like iCarly. He did Hannah Montana for Disney and, and whatever it is, and he feels like it's a good thing what happened. And Herb Scannell and Albie and some of the executives who kind of helped move Nickelodeon into this kind of mega monster it is today, and I mean monster again in the best possible way. It's huge now. That's great in some ways. And they were like, look, we're getting this great quality entertainment to kids everywhere. We're merchandising now, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think there's definitely a very valid point to that. Um, You know, the shows back in the day were really great and maybe a little bit more special in some ways, but no one was getting paid. And if someone got hurt, it was kind of sorry, and there was no unions, and Certain things that, so, you know, there was a bit of a trade-off, sure, but, you know, it, it's hard to say. So you have, you, you need to be a little objective, but it definitely is your favorite restaurant that's now serving completely different food now, and the same owner's not there, and they're playing different music now, and you're basically just going to this old restaurant that's the same building, but everything else is different. I mean, that's just the way it is. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Matthew. Um, it's interesting, though, because... You have to start off where Nickelodeon first started. I mean, you had a tiny little network in Columbus, Ohio, that when it first began, it was just basically showing a lot of educational programs. And when there were some shows, there was like a moment in which you actually had to like push the the remote or something or change the channel for a decision to be made. Yeah, uh, it started as some as actually an experiment in uh, interactive television uh, as something called Cube, which was really uh, you know, one of the first boxes, 
uh, and they were really actually trying to uh, partner up with uh, American Express. That's why it was called Warner Amex for a while. And basically, the idea was that you know, in choosing what you wanted to watch, uh, they could read on a six-second feed what everyone's watching and be able to use that as very direct information for advertisers. And Amex got involved because they really thought that things like Home Shopping Network and stuff like that, or the precursors to them, would really take off and be the future of cable. Um, and yeah, during all of this kind of experimenting with the box and with home uh, shopping and American Express and getting other really early cable channels like Movie Channel off the ground, basically Nickelodeon was a total loss leader in that you know they could get communities uh, throughout the country to go with their package with Wasex package, Warner Amex Satellite Entertainment Company, because they would say. You know, don't go with the other guys. They're showing nudity and they're doing this and that. Go with us. We have the kids' channel that's award-winning and that you know will teach your kids and this, that, or the other thing. And that was really why Nickelodeon was created. I mean, that was the reason. Uh, and so no one was really paying attention to the content at all. Um, some of it, you know, and I'm, I'm uh, uploading some of the uh, you know uh, clips and such online right now. And you know, some of it you can find and you know pinwheel and pre-pinwheel stuff. Uh, it's kind of interesting to watch uh, now, but yeah, it definitely kids didn't like it then. They really didn't. It was it was for babies. It was for little kids, and they didn't want to watch it. So, and unfortunately, no one at Wasek really seemed to care because it was doing what it was supposed to do, which was getting communities to uh, purchase their package. So, no one was really kind of minding the store and saying, "Well, let's actually make something that kids would like, rather than just something that will sell." the rest of these channels because we have the quote-unquote kids channel. Yeah, I can definitely understand that. Since this was uh, the early 80s and you had a lot of cartoons that came out during that time, and then when you had a, a channel like Nickelodeon, which was featuring a lot of educational programs and a lot of acquired cartoons and TV shows and some of the original content, it didn't really hit. Like, for example, even though that let's just say a show like Livewire, even though it was popular, I mean, it was just nothing more than a talk show. And then, of course, you know, later on, um, you would have other programs that got really low ratings, almost at the point where the network was pretty much bankrupt and it was almost about to be shut down. Is it true that at one point it was actually going to be, you know, like completely being pulled out of the plug because it was dubbed as the worst network on television? Yeah, you know, it's funny. When I talk to the executives who were involved in it in those earliest, earliest stages, and, and be sure, Pat, uh, Patricia, we're going back to mid-70s. I mean, we're going back to 77. Um, and so, you know, this was even before the early 80s. Early 80s, things were at least picking up a little bit. Um, you know, and this is when Jerry and they got involved in 83. Um, but, um, no, it, yeah, it, it definitely was at a point where they just were, were done putting any money into it. At all, and this is also when we had the split off, where they were um, uh, getting more involved with uh, MTV, because it was a lot of the same people there, and the money was just being kind of passed around, and everything was going to MTV, which was another thing that was hard, because that comes out in 1981. Um, so suddenly, the, the entire budget is basically going to everything except for Nickelodeon, um, and you know, MTV was a success sort of right away, but. When I have, um, when I had discussions with some of those early executives, they do keep bringing up that money or no, uh, Nickelodeon was winning all these awards and was also making a really big headway with things like ACT, uh, who, which is an acronym whose name I can't remember right now, but it's something like Association for Children's Television or something, yeah. where it was people working, Peggy Charon and those kinds of folks working to try to make children's television better. Um, and they loved Nickelodeon because they felt that Nickelodeon was at least attempting to do that. And they liked especially the fact that Nickelodeon didn't show commercials yet. Um, so uh, Nickelodeon was maybe not doing very well money-wise, but it was definitely in the headlines and winning a lot of awards and being praised for what it was doing. So I think it was being kept afloat for that reason. Uh, but yeah, they definitely were pulling money from it. And when all the MTV stuff was going on and the stuff with Viacom taking over and I believe 85... Um, you know, that was when, you know, they had to bring in this ragtag team of Jerry Laybourne and Fred Seibert, Alan Goodman, uh, Jeffrey Darby, Scott Webb, and a few of the others who basically just got together at Jerry's house and said, okay, let's start from scratch. They almost changed the entire name of the network uh, and said, you know, what are we going to do to make this actually work? And I'm sure you've heard it. There's been many articles written, you know, it's the whole 
legend of from uh, worst to first in six months. And that's exactly what they did without any, any more money and without any new programming. It was just literally how they repackaged everything uh, and how they started using promos, how they started doing scheduling. I mean, part of the problem with Nickelodeon in the earliest days, they weren't even um, letting kids or parents know when certain things were on. You had to just sort of guess. You know, this show would be on Tuesday night, and then next week it would be on Wednesday night. There's actually a term for it. I don't remember it, but um, there were, you didn't even know what show was going to be on what night at what time. I mean, it was completely a mess. And again, it was because the people running Nickelodeon they didn't really care. Uh, it was just it, it could have been blank TV, and they would it would have been the same thing. It was just this award-winning children's entertainment that they could use to sell the movie channel and uh, the rest of their package. Yeah, I do remember that. I, I wrote an article regarding about when Nickelodeon was bankrupt and then due to the success of Fred Seibert and Alan Goodman and Jerry Layborn and all those people. And then, of course, uh, Kevin and I, we did actually talk to Fred Seibert about the same um, experience. And I found it to be really interesting about how they decided to start over from scratch and what was um, going to be their definition of bringing the network back and how the logo came to be and eventually, you know, some of the original program that was going to be coming out. I mean, even though that we had programs such as um, Livewire and Mr. Wizard's World and Pop Clips and Nick Rocks and You Can't Do That on Television... I can assure you that many people, whenever they discuss old school Nickelodeon, they would immediately go to Double Dare. Yeah, I mean, Double Dare was obviously, you know, the first really big original hit. Uh, you Can't Do That on Television was great because it brought them the slime aesthetic. And, you know, also the, the philosophy and psychology of it was really important, which was the kids' first fun that Nickelodeon really took on, which was totally and completely Roger Price's uh, concept, who was the uh, main creator of You Can't Do That on Television. And, Roger, Jerry, and Jeffrey Darby all, you know, agree that that was totally Roger Price, um, uh, who's a very interesting person, but that's a whole other story. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, you know, you can't did a lot for Nickelodeon. Finally, people were really watching the network. People were talking about it. Um, it, in many ways, made Nickelodeon be able to do something like Double Dare, but Double Dare definitely took it to a whole other level. Um, I don't know if it's a story that uh, you've heard before or read elsewhere, um, but it's a fun one that I think is in the book. I can't remember now what actually stayed in the book or what didn't. But when they knew that Double Dare was going to be something very special for the network and in television in general was when, I don't know if you remember, but they actually, uh, in the earliest episodes, would say, would say where everyone was staying. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Double Dare crew and staff stay at Blah Blah Hotel, um, which was, you know, good because they got a discount for the hotel and the hotel got some exposure. Well, what the hotel did not expect was this literally happened, I think, on like the second episode or something, was so many kids were calling the hotel to try to get in touch with Mark Summers and Harvey and everyone. It literally blew out their phone service uh, to the point where it kept happening so many times because. Double Dare would be shown, you know, in every t different time zone. So it would happen throughout the day to the point where the um, the hotel actually called Nickelodeon and said, "You need to take that out of your show. You have to cut that out." And Nickelodeon actually said, "We've already produced these episodes. They're going to be running. To redo them now, you would actually have to pay us to do it." And you know what? The hotel did it because it was actually worth paying Nickelodeon to take that out so that their phone lines weren't being blown out every time uh, Double Dare was being shown the two or three times a day it was shown. I mean, that's how successful it was. It was a whole other level. They were getting numbers that I don't think any children's entertainment was getting. And immediately, I mean, immediately, uh, you know, and at the end of the day, I think they ended up doing like 600 episodes, eight years of live touring. And, I mean, you know, the this, this show is just a whole other level. Um, and, you know, of course the magic there is the people who created it, Jeffrey and Bob Mittenthal and Jerry and Debbie BC and everyone, but, you know, Mark Summers uh, brought something that was so special to the network and to that show. I mean, there's a reason everyone calls him the godfather of Nickelodeon, um, plus his dynamic with Harvey and Robin um, was also something that I think a lot of kids tune into, that parents liked watching, and they, they had that, that really great combination that Pixar was able to do and it still kind of does here or there but it was really able to do with like the Incredibles and uh, Nemo which is you know the kids enjoy it for 
the fun of it, the parents can enjoy it because it's smart and because they're saying stuff for the parents too. Mark and Robin and Harvey were making jokes the parents got and the kids were loving it because they were all laughing and that there was slime. So everyone wins. Yeah, it definitely reminds me of an interview that Gabor Chupo did regarding about Rugrats. Right. He said that Rugrats was a show that was great for both kids and adults because the kids were able to get into the characters and the imaginations while the adults were getting into the pop culture references, like Dr. Lipschitz being a reference to Dr. Spock, and references from movies and TV shows like Dances with Wolves, and Rocky II, A Christmas Story, and so on and so forth. So I get, I definitely get what you're saying, and I think that was really smart for them to do this because... I think that this is one of the many reasons why Double Dare has held many kids' hearts even still to this very day. And I don't think that a lot of game shows, either based on Nickelodeon or any other kids' game show that featured in other channels, were able to replicate. Sure, you can be able to make a game show that looked cool and had neat prizes, but I think the dynamic was that the game show hosts really brought it in. Which is why, I mean, I don't know of how you feel about this... Because, uh, you know, I don't want to put you under the bus. But I did a podcast recently and we were talking about how around the 80s, after Mark Summers did Double Dare, and then you had a lot of game shows such as Think Fast, Make the Grade, and Get the Picture. Well, although that some of the game shows were kind of cool, we could definitely agree that the hosts would definitely try to capture that Mark Summers feel, but failed miserably and ended up being extremely generic and forgettable. I mean, there's no question that Mark Summers uh, was not just a paradigm. He was a paragon. Um, you know, he was something that everyone was aspiring to, and he, not everyone could do it. Um, I know Mark Summers today. I was just talking to him. Uh, he's become a very, very close friend. Uh, I've been talking with him regularly for the last year and a half. Uh, and as I've, as I've said from day one, you would think, you know, excuse my French, but that a, a, a game show host would be a total douchebag. And from moment one, from the first time I called him, before I had a book deal, before I had anything, when I was still just this, you know, idiot kid who was calling out of the blue just to see if I could talk to the Mark Summers, he, he immediately said yes. Uh, and he's, you know, I, I don't want people to start bugging him or calling or anything, but, uh, you know, and he jokes about this. He says yes to everything. He wants to talk to everybody. He wants to be involved in everything. He has so much energy. It's amazing. He's in his 60s now. And, you know, he practically runs Food Network. He's doing all this stuff for Travel Network. I don't know how the hell he does so much. Um, you know, I'm even lucky enough to be involved in one of his projects on Food Network. And I talk with the staff. I talk with the employees. They all love him. Everyone I talk to, uh, and, you know, throughout the process of the Nickelodeon book, all brought up Mark as a hero. You know, even some of the kids who were on the shows who might not have ever met him, you know, said, I got to be on the network with Mark Summers and Double Dare. I mean, it was huge. When I had lunch with Keenan Thompson... It was one of the things, it was pretty much all he talked about was Double Dare. Um, you know, it was, it was such a big deal for us um, growing up. And to see that, you know, I didn't watch game shows as a kid. I still don't. My mom actually never really wanted me to watch them. She thought they rotted your brain, funnily enough. Um, so I didn't really watch game shows then or now. Um, but I watched Double Dare. And I watched Double Dare because of Mark. And I watched Double Dare because of Harvey and Robin and Alan Silverberg and the slime and the obstacle courses and, you know, the physical challenges, the way they built that show, the way they structured the show, again, was very smart because, um, you know, you you kind of had to watch the whole episode to get all the fun. You know, even if you didn't particularly care for the questions and answer section, you still watched it because you wanted to see the physical challenges. Um, and, you know, plus, again, Mark is so funny. And, um, you know, I spoke to some of the writers of the show, like Alan and others, um, who are smart people, are funny people. They're still doing stuff today. They've written for other shows like King of the Hill and uh, Doug and other things. I mean, I think that was one of the special things about Nickelodeon at that time, too. Double Dare, Elsewise, you know, Pete and Pete's an amazing example. Every single person who was involved in it is doing so much stuff today. You know, books, movies, music, uh, other television. Uh, you know, uh, there's very few people, at least on the camera side or the you know, the crew side of Nickelodeon who aren't, you know, uh, masters of the universe in the media world right now. I mean, almost everybody's doing stuff. Um, so I think uh, I think that was part of, the, of what was really special then, too, was a place for these young 20, 25-year-old uh, filmmakers and artists and musicians and writers to really just go hog wild and have some fun. You know, they weren't getting paid much, but they were able to kind of do whatever they wanted. And uh, Nickelodeon let them do that. And... Uh, 
I think that's why those shows were something that was really special. And unfortunately, we might not be able to really see that again, even on the internet or whatever, when allegedly that's happening a little bit more. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's still being paid for by certain advertisers or YouTube as an entity or Google as an entity, which, you know, they're, they're watching things, I would imagine, a little closer than Nickelodeon was at that time, which would basically people like Jerry and Jeffrey just saying, go and do whatever you want and make it fun. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I and I truly, truly um, agree about Mark Summers. I interviewed him last year, and we talked a little bit about Double Dare. And I can tell you that the the joy that he had when talking about it, it just felt so, so strong. The presence that he did when he talked about the fond memories of the show. And I can assure you that there are so many people who still, even to this day, still respect Mark Summers and still call him, indeed, the greatest game show host that Nickelodeon has ever had. And, you know, he was even nice enough. I, I have an autographed picture of him. It's hanging on my wall right now. And um, even though that, you know, I only talked to him just once, I mean, just that alone was an amazing experience that he was able to take the time to talk to me, as well as um, all the other dozens of people that Kevin and I got a hold of during the Nickelodeon tribute, uh, you know, including you and Thad, who wrote the Ren and Stimpy book, and, you know, DJ Mikhail, and a lot of the people. So, and also with Nickelodeon, you did bring up a really interesting point about it's just a bunch of young people who are able to be free and do what they please. I think that's what um, a lot of TV networks are missing out on even today with people being able to express themselves, to be able to create something brand new and fresh and magical that nobody's ever seen before. And it just felt like their passion being spilled all over the screen. And I just feel that that kind of passion alone is what many people can see and they can be able to appreciate as opposed to like some show that has a really beautiful girl or a man and they're just basically talking about a bunch of jokes that you heard a million times before and then the setting is nice. When you see something that, you know, you see a person who just looks really regular and the setting is really basic, there's just a charm to it that... Even a show that is technically impressive cannot be able to replicate. And when I talked to DJ and he was talking to me about how Disney was able to... Um, I'm sorry, Nickelodeon was able to let him eventually do Are You Afraid of the Dark? He called it the anti-Disney. Uh, when Disney was basically like very safe for children, Nickelodeon was a lot more edgier. Yeah, that was actually a term that a lot of people I spoke to... Um uh, used uh, uh, pretty much all of the executives, all of the creative personnel uh, used the phrase anti-Disney. Uh, even some of the ones who you would expect wouldn't say that. Um, and uh, just because they might have ended up working on Disney uh, then and now and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and that's also really the arc, unfortunately. And this, is, this too is discussed in the book. And again, you know, not to impose any of my own homonyms here or anything like that. But at the end of the day, um, the narrative of Nickelodeon, and a couple people said this, I think Will McRobb is, is the person I end up attributing it to in the book, but the, um, the arc is going from anti-Disney to Disney. And that's really what happened with Nickelodeon. Um, you know, in fact, and a few different people said this, you know, when you, when you flip the channels now between Disney and Nick, it's hard to tell the difference. Uh, and before, it was very easy to tell the difference. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, you know, Disney had some shows that I enjoyed as a kid. I liked Under the Umbrella Tree. I liked Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, I liked watching some of the old Disney cartoons. They're great. I mean, it's fun to have a channel where you can watch those. Um, but then, you know, I'd put on Nick and watch Salute Your Shorts and Double Dare. Uh, and, you know, I think it's really important to have that distinction. Now, yeah, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't really know what's necessarily on either of them anymore. I'm 31 years old. I don't watch, you know, children's television anymore. Uh, although I might have in the 80s with Nickelodeon because people did watch over 30, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but, um, you know, if you, if you flip back and forth now or when I am looking over someone's shoulder or whatever, hearing what kids are watching or, you know, friends of mine who teach, you know, kids or friends of mine who even have kids or whatever, um, you know, they, they all bring that up. And a lot of the Nickelodeon people I spoke to brought it up. They said, you know, there's really no difference anymore. Uh, and and they, they're almost following each other. There's even a lot of cross-promotional stuff, which I guess is, in some ways is a good thing. But the fact that you can have Disney stars at the Nick Kids Choice Awards is a little bit weird. Um, you know, and someone actually even brought that up. So it, it, it's, it's a little sad that that's going on, that Disney's chasing Nick, that Nick is chasing Disney. 
because when that happens, you're not getting that kind of originality and spontaneity that they were getting back in the day, where they were intensely trying to do the opposite of what Disney was doing. Um, or even better, just doing their own thing and not worrying about it at all. Uh, you know, so I think that that's sad that we that we've lost that uh, delineation. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, who, who knows? Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know what? Um, you know, as time goes on, I think people are starting to see the difference. And I think that as time goes on, um, a new generation will come by and be able to change what we are associated with when it comes to entertainment. We, they can be able to bring something new to the to the page, and they can be able to generate something completely brand new that we would have never seen before. And whether it be on Disney or Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network or wherever, just as long as people can be able to dish out some ingenuity and creativity, I think that's what makes people come back. I mean, to some extent, um, you know, when it comes to Nickelodeon, um, they're able to make new changes and twists to, to, to the, you know, the old classics. Like, some people are saying, like, the new iteration of Ninja Turtles is the best one. Uh, some people say that, you know, Legend of Korra is just as good as Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, some people are saying that um, the, some of the live-action shows are starting to get better, but not by much. And, you know, you also have the Disney programs, and you also have the Cartoon Network programs, and then you have channels such as The Hub. So, yeah, I think that as time goes on, we will be able to see something new come into the table. Uh, another thing that I really was noticing when it comes to Nickelodeon, um, sure, you have the shows that would be popular and the actors who are portraying it, but what really interested me the most was the promotions and the commercial stops. You know what I'm saying? Like, every time you, when, before, during, or after the show would end, you would see, like, an animation that would have, like, the classic doo-wop music and the animation, and a lot of it done by Joey Album, and I, I just find that to be really fascinating. Uh, I, when I did the Nickelodeon tribute, I first saw it, um, him doing an interview with Letter Nimoy in uh, Standby Lights, Camera Action, and then I, eventually later on, he would be the main man responsible for doing a lot of the animation. So, um, what made them decide to do, um, you know, those promotional um, ads? And uh, out of all the music, especially since it was the 80s, do doo-wop music? Um, well, those are two, uh, again, different questions. Um, and, and to be sure, it was not just Joey. It was also George Evelyn. And uh, there were a few other really great animators who were involved in the promotions. You could really see the different distinctions um, in uh, the bumpers. Um, and, you know, Joey's was really the stuff with the, uh, the dinosaurs and, and the sneakers. And George's, you know, it, it tended to be, you know, some of the talking fruit and things like that, as well as um, you know, even some of the people from some of the Nicktoons uh, crew uh, did some of the Nicktoons bumpers and things of that nature. Um, so there were a few people doing it. Joey was definitely one of the big ones. And as I'm sure you know, Joey actually has a new series of children's books that Fred Seibert's putting out now, um, which will be kind of cool. And, of course, it's the dinosaur thing again. Yeah, uh, uh, Lucy but, the Dinosaur. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm on Fred's page, and I see it constantly being advertised. So, yeah, I've been seeing that. Yeah, and so, um, uh, you know, the bumpers were created because it goes back to what we were talking about. They didn't have a lot of money. Um, and some of the first things that they were really able to do was, um, you know, Bob Pittman and some of the people at Viacom and, and MTV and that kind of thing were basically just saying, look, we're giving you just this amount of money and you have to kind of do what you can with it. And so they had to take, you know, reruns of Lassie and, you know, these other kind of, you know, a few other here or there little uh, bric-a-brac uh, shows and things and do it the best they could with them. And what they did was they made those classic, amazing bumpers that we all remember of, you know, Mr. Ed and Lassie will be right back. And you know, even before, you know, some of the animated stuff where they're just basically playing with, you know, sort of the, the proto Nick at Night uh, bumpers. And, you know, those were so much fun. And that was a lot of that was Debbie BC and definitely Scott Webb and his, uh, you know, on air promotions department where, frankly, you know, everyone came out of it. It was kind of an early incubator. Um, creatively for Nickelodeon, you learned how to think like and write like and produce like Nickelodeon there, and a, a lot of people started there. Bob Mittenthal and Will and Chris from Pete and Pete 
and a number of other folks who would go on to create their own shows and to become writers and producers at Nickelodeon, they were starting off um, by making these short little bumpers. And they were really just having fun. Uh, all the pictures I've seen of uh, the on-air promotions department, you know, it looks like a bunch of, you know, kids just, you know, drinking and having fun on the rooftop and, and screwing around the offices and, you know, those kinds of things. They were all so incredibly creative. And what they had to do was take very little and do something really big with it. And I think that that was a big backbone to the whole from first to worst, or from worst to first thing. Because, you know, they took nothing and turned it into something, and something very special. Um, so I think that that was a really big element. And, you know, just to kind of wrap this up, as I'm sure you know, uh, but some of your listeners might not, uh, what Fred and Alan were doing, Fred Seibert and Alan Goodman, was extremely unique. The whole idea of having a channel just for kids and the whole idea of having a channel just for music because they were involved in the branding for MTV too um, was very revolutionary. Um, and they were coming from the radio world. And a lot of the people were coming from the magazine world. And it was this idea of let's have a destination place where rather than saying, um, you know, watch this show or watch that show, it was saying watch Nickelodeon. And that was something that people hadn't really thought about doing in television before. Everyone was always drawing you to the ep- to the shows, singularly. They weren't drawing you as a whole, collectively, to the network. Um, and that's what those bumpers were about. Uh, as far as the music was concerned, um, you know, Fred and Alan liked doo They came from the music world. Uh, Fred, uh, you know, and Alan were, you know, doing a lot with, uh, you know, record companies and that kind of thing. Uh, it was one of the reasons they were involved in MTV. Uh, and they just personally liked doo and they did some studies and things and found that little children like the sound of doo but it was also something that's very unique and special when you watch like a Tim Burton movie a lot of the time he plays with this really strange kind of um, you know uh, tropical jazz type music that uh, is very is at once very familiar and lulling but also very strange and weird because you don't hear it very often you don't hear it in a lot of movies like the music in Mars Attacks for example um, so I think it was something that really distinguished them it was something that, again, was familiar, um, but that was also very interesting and new. Um, kids apparently liked that kind of sound. Um, they liked that sound, and they felt that they were doing something that was, you know, almost humanitarian in bringing, a, you know, if you will, black culture to uh, children, especially a lot of children who uh, were from maybe a different culture. Uh, so, uh, you know, those were a lot of the reasons that they did that. Um, and, they, you know, a lot of it was just personal. They liked the sound of doo they still do. Uh, Fred and Alan are still really into doo-wop today. Um, you know, if you go to Fred's office at Frederator, you know, he's got all these doo-wop records all over his office, his personal office. I mean, it's just, they happen to like. And that was something that was, I think, really important also at Nickelodeon. It goes back to what I was talking about before about Nickelodeon and Jerry really let people kind of do what they want. And so a lot of them are just literally doing what they wanted. You know, it was literally, hey, I like this music. I'm going to play it. Hey, I like this sound. I'm going to use it. Hey, I like the way that this animation looks. I'm going to use this. Um, and Jerry and Nick said, sure, go for it. Let's see what you can do. And you know what? People liked it. Um, there, it wasn't as much as um, uh, creativity by committee. It was just these really smart people who said, I like this music. I'm going to play it. That sounds great. And to think that Nickelodeon started off so small and then eventually would generate a whole bunch of um, shows and movies and then eventually have their own studios to film it all. And, you know, they're... You know, even though that some people say that Nickelodeon is going downhill, event, you know, you have to look at the fact that the network is still growing bigger and bigger, just to some extent. Look, exactly. That, that's something I, I definitely wanted to discuss in the book, which I did. I, I wanted it to be as objective as possible. Um, you know, look, let's be honest. It's called, you know, Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, which does obviously right there imply that this is not necessarily the Golden Age now. Uh, but, you know, that's fine. I have friends at Nickelodeon right now, uh, some of them pretty high up, and they're all very excited about the book. Um, I'm sure a few of them have read it. Um, you know, there's even, you know, been some possible connection discussions. And, you know, we'll see what the future brings. Obviously, Nickelodeon's getting more interested itself in its older shows and its 90s shows and such. I mean, we know this, you know, from even a year or two ago when they first started re-airing you know a lot of those shows the block and that kind of thing so they're they're aware of it uh, you know no, no one no one needs to pretend um but there's definitely mention in the book of some of the people saying look the fact that nickelodeon is doing 
you know, is making so much money now, and the fact that Nickelodeon is as big as it is now, and the whole global thing going on, is in itself its own accomplishment. Uh, one of my heroes is uh, Fugazi and Minor Threats, Ian Mackay, and he said something really, really smart in an amazing documentary called Fugazi Instrument that was made by Jem Cohen years ago, where, you know, he's, he says very bluntly that, you know, to be able to sell, you know, a million copies of one thing in one day, like a lot of pop stars can do, is an amazing talent. It's an amazing accomplishment. You know, it's not what he wants to do. It's not what Fugazi and Minor Threat were and are about. Um, but, you know, it's still something that he's, he's really in awe of, and he really respects it. You can see in the documentary, he's not being sardonic. He's not being snarky. It's just not what he's about. And I think that's where we come back with the Nick thing, is, you know, for some people, being global and being international and having Nickelodeon merchandise in every store and having everyone know what it is and, and all this stuff is, is, is an accomplishment. It's a talent. I don't know how to do that. Um, and I would imagine a lot of the original Nickelodeon show creators wouldn't necessarily know how to do it. What they knew how to do was making these much smaller, more intimate, quirkier uh, shows and scripts and music and what have you that yeah, not everyone's going to get and that not everyone's going to hear here. Um, and that's not going to make as much money. I mean, one thing that a lot of people forget right now is how incredibly poorly those shows did in comparison to now or, or shows on Nickelodeon now or anywhere else. I mean, the shows didn't do that great. I mean, they didn't get that big of, a, of an audience or a viewership. They did well for cable at that time, and they did well for children's television at that time. They certainly did well in comparison to what Nickelodeon was doing. But, you know, a lot of these shows were on for two or three seasons, and there's a reason. They weren't really bringing the money in um, until, you know, uh, 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 shows like Ren and Stimpy and such. I mean, Double Dare did amazingly well. You, can do, you Can't Do That on Television did very well for them, but, you know, it's not like the way shows are, are working now, where it's, it's a whole other level. Uh, and a lot of that's the digital realm and things like that. So, you know, it depends. Nickelodeon, in some ways, is doing amazing right now, and in some ways, is not doing so amazing. And Nickelodeon back then was doing amazing in some ways, and was not doing amazing back then. I mean, as I said, you know, there's a whole section of the book about there was no unions and people weren't getting paid and if you got hurt, you just kind of had to take it and deal with it. It was a little bit more of, uh, you know, the wild, wild west, which some people thought was really fun and some people have injuries that they still have from back in the day. You know, they really hurt their ear and they will always have that or they really hurt their leg or whatever. Um, you know, you better believe that that would never happen now, uh, which is kind of a good thing. Um, so it, it depends. It's all relevant. All right. Well, that was certainly quite a speech there, Matthew. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that. Um, are there any? Is there anything that you would like to um, plug or promote right before we conclude this episode? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I just really hope everyone will buy the book. Um, you know, uh, I think it's a shame. And again, I'll, I'll do my best to keep the short box really short. But uh, uh, the soapbox really short. But. Uh, I think it's it's a shame that people aren't reading as much anymore, and I really even don't like the whole ebook thing. When you're reading a Kindle, when you're reading a tablet, people can't see what you're reading. And if you're on the subway, if you're at a coffee shop, people can't come up to you and, and uh, engender a discussion about it. And, and you've met a new friend, or you're talking with someone about, wow, you're reading that too, or I didn't know that that was out. And that in itself is something really great. And yeah, as the author, as a writer, as someone who's trying to make money doing this, you know, I, I'm... I'm not coming for money myself. I hope this sells well. I hope, you know, I, this helps my career. Um, you know, it, it's not going to sell as many books either. Um, and I think that that ultimately hurts the authors. I think that that ultimately hurts the publishers. Um, I'm very happy that Kindle and Barnes and & Noble and Amazon and such are involved in this project. And, you know, we'll be selling the e-books and that we have, they're going to have the audio books and such. But, you know, buy the, buy the hardcover. It's really cool. You know, walk around with it. Show people it. You know, talk about it with people. You know, I, I, I both as a businessman, but as an artist and as someone who wants to see his work out there and as someone who likes that medium, you know, uh, let's keep that alive. I think that that's really important. Um, and, you know, don't don't download a bootleg of it, you know, that they're, that they're out there. Um, you know, aside from myself, a lot of people work really, really hard on this book, from the art designers to the editors. Uh, and a lot of them are young and, and hardworking, just like the people who are, you know, downloading these things and whatnot. And, you know, let's keep the publishing world alive. And the better a book like this does, the more kinds of books like this we can do. I, I'll be able to do a second volume. 
Um, I'll be able to do books about other aspects of Nickelodeon or other things from our uh, nostalgia hood or childhood that people really like. I mean, that's how, how it works. If this does well, then we can do more. If it doesn't do well because people are downloading bootlegs or they're not reading it at all or, or whatever it might be or just, you know, scanning, scanning through it at the bookstore and then, you know, leaving it there, you know, we're not going to see more of this kind of stuff. And that would really be a shame. We'll end up with a world that only plutocrats can be created because they'll be the only ones who could afford to make books or movies or or whatever it might be. Let, let's keep it so that regular people can make art, too, and put it out there and make a living doing it. Uh, because this was really, really, really hard. This was totally time-consuming for the last year. I could not have done this with uh, another job or two part-time jobs, um, you know, and uh, my parents are not wealthy. I didn't have money going into this. Um, you know, let's, let's keep this alive. So please buy the book. <laughs> um, please buy other books. Uh, you know, keep books a lot, uh, keep reading them, keep buying them, and keep talking about them. It's really, really important. Uh, you know, even books about television like this one, as hypocritical as that might be. That's okay. Um, I <laughs> own a copy of um, Thad Komorowski's Sick Little Monkeys, The Unauthorized Ren and Stimpy Story, and I own a couple of books regarding about television and pop culture, so I completely understand what you're going at. So, uh, once again, um, this has been Matthew Clickstein, and his book is Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, will be coming out in late September, and if you're interested in going to his book event, it is on Friday, September 27th, at the 92nd Street Y Performing Arts Educational Center in New York City. So, once again, thank you so much, Matthew, for taking the time to be interviewing with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And this has been another episode of Casual Chats, and we hope to see you on the next one. So take care and have a good day.